Delighted to say I'm joined by legendary football commentator Martin Tyler. Martin, how's it going? Good to see you. Well, it's great to see you, Harry. And uh, yeah, the, the, I like the weather because it's going to help England. It's not Spanish weather, is it? So, uh, and I'm very optimistic. It's, uh, it's a great achievement for England to get to the final. It's a wonderful city to have the final in. Uh, and you can tell them I mean, we're still quite a way away from nine o'clock on match day nine o'clock in the evening and uh, there's a lovely buzz about the place so everything's good so far it's on the result <laughs> yeah of course it is a results business particularly yeah. in international football particularly mm. in a situation like this mm. what have you made of the criticism that England have faced in this tournament so far has it been a bit over the top in your opinion um, I, all I can tell you is that, that my memories of 1966 when England won the World Cup I did go to one of the group games. I, I wasn't lucky enough to get a ticket for that final. I've been lucky enough to get one for this one. Um, and Alf Ramsey got a lot of stick. He changed the formation for the quarter final, actually. Played three different wingers in the three group games. There wasn't a round of 16 game. And he decided, well, none of these wingers, I've played a different one in every game. None of them uh, has done the job. So we're going to play a different way. And uh, England weren't, you know, they weren't getting slaps on the back. Uh, until the final and then uh, I think the semi-final because Portugal were very good beat, uh, beat Portugal at Wembley in the semi-final but it was at home the last Euro was at home and we mustn't forget that Gareth Southgate's made history already and the players have made history by getting to a final away from England which is uh, it's taken a bit of doing hasn't it there have been plenty of efforts and coming close but well, this is special now make the history hold up the silverware first parts in place for the second. <laughs> what have you made of Gareth Southgate's England tenure overall? Because I've heard a lot of people say over the last week or so that, look, England are in another final and regardless of whether they win it or not, obviously everybody wants them to, but regardless of whether they do or not, this is still a manager that's achieved an awful lot with this England side. Yeah, I get that. I'm with that point of view as well. Um, I do think that he's changed the, the culture within the camp, which of course is the start, really. I mean, it may be the start, the middle and the end, to be honest. Um, he won't change the culture of criticism, that's the way the media work and I've been part of that and you know, I, I wouldn't um, criticise journalism, for sports journalism, the people, good people uh, making their own minds up on it. Um, but I think the way he's handled everything within the camp, the football side of it, is a great testimony. The point you make is a very valid one for all these semi-finals. But people forget the Nations League, the first Nations League in 2019, England got to the semi-final of that as well. So that's one that doesn't really get added in. It's not counted as a major tournament, but it's in Gareth's tenure. So, and I think the general level of integrity he's brought to the job, he's a statesman-like figure, really. He probably wouldn't thank me for saying that, but he rarely puts the word out of place. He's had to deal with issues that being a football coach and an intelligent man, but you're not really a, a, an expert on some of the issues that he's had to confront, uh, off the field stuff, politics, um, and he's not really Mr. Beat in that as well. So uh, outstanding. History will judge him well, um, uh, very well, but even better than that if, they, if he can win, the, win a trophy. Because I, I wonder whether he'll want to carry on whatever the result, you know. Um, so sometimes you've got to appreciate what you have, and you might not do that until you haven't. And I hope, um, I would hope him to stay on, but I think he's knowing him a little bit as I do. I think there'll be a lot of questions, a lot of questions after the World Cup, his, his questions to himself. So hopefully, hopefully that will be a strong place to have the, the inner debate because it'll be one half of his brain arguing with the other half of his brain. I don't think any, any of us will come into it. Um, but it's a, a special man and, as you say, a special reign. If it were me and I won the Euros, if I were Gareth Southgate, I think I would probably walk away. I think I would want to go out on a high. I think I would want to have that crowning moment because I think the criticism that he's faced has been difficult for him to deal with at times. Uh, I, I thought in one of his press conferences, maybe a couple of games ago, he seemed like it was getting to him a little bit, which I thought was really horrible to see because of how good a job he's done. Well, maybe just uh, it doesn't always let his own feelings come through. Maybe he did. And I, I know the press conference you were referring to. Uh, but it's a drug, football. Yeah. I mean, I've been in it since I was eight years old. I went to Woking when I was eight years old and I'm 78 now and I've not missed the weekend football. <laughs> you know, I just, whatever little contribution or whatever feel I get my fix from it, if you like, put it another way. It's football helping me, not me helping football. So um, it, it does it does get under your skin and it's, it's hard to walk away from. And when you're 
Sir Gareth he'll be if he wins it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, and I, I spent some time with Sir Alf Ramsey after he left the England job, you know, and it was it it wasn't life wasn't the same for him. So we'll see if if he gets offered a plum Premier League job or maybe a plum Continental job as well. Then then I think it would be easy for him to make that decision if he wants to make it. But I'd rather think we've still got him and we've got two days to go. And um, hopefully those last two days are a bit like Jimmy Anderson's cricket career, you know, comes with a win at the end and, uh, and being applauded off because the England fans have been great. Well, certainly, and they haven't really been caught up, I don't think, too much in the criticism. Uh, certainly the ones that have been in Germany, they've enjoyed watching their team, they come to watch their team. And I've, I've said to many people, Harry, that it's about winning. It is about winning, however you win. Of course, if you can win perfectly, with a wonderful performance, that's, that's the real deal. But win, win and then argue about the performance. Lose, even, losing and playing well, I've seen England teams down the years, and I've been at a lot of the defeats in major tournaments. Performance has been okay, but I haven't won. Yeah, so. That's it. Um, switching into kind of commentator mode a little mm. bit. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm, I'm working as a commentator myself, nowhere near the same level as you, of course. I um, hope to get there someday, but I'm really interested in the sort of preparation process for a game like this because I'm assuming you've got a process that you would apply across most games, but does it change for a game like a Euro final? I think there's a bit more protocol to factor into, a bit more of how the event is going to be run. You know, who's going to be a guest of honour, who's, what's going to happen, how the presentation's going to take place. Funny enough, um, the organisations, whether it's FIFA, UEFA or the FA, or, 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 I think the Premier League are the best at telling you how it's going to happen. Um, so you don't always get the information you think, well, they must know. <laughs> and I, I remember doing the opening ceremony at, uh, in Germany here in 2006 in, in Munich um, at about half an hour's notice. I said, oh, well, we haven't got, there's no voice on it. So I was doing, working for an Australian channel. Listen. So I sort of really bluffed my way through it. So there's a bit of that. You're going to have to be ready for bluffing, I think. <laughs> but of course, it is, just, it is another game. And so the principles that have applied that have got you to being sitting in the gantry in the final is, um, you know, you shouldn't stray away from those and you, you shouldn't give it, you've got to sound like you normally sound. Yeah, if there is a moment, obviously I've been associated with one or two moments that are extra, extra special. If England were to, the final whistle and, and um, Sam and Guy were doing it for British television, um, they'll be thinking about what that might mean I'm not saying they'll, they'll create their words, but recognize the smell of the fixture is what I call it. Every fixture has a smell. This has a very, very uh, nice aroma about it. And uh, you've just got to be sure that what you thought about on Tuesday may not be relevant today. You know, I mean, it might be somebody doesn't play who you've spent a lot of time on. So I always like to give myself a little bit of time on the day pretty much at the ground, really, before we actually normally get the teams maybe 75 minutes. That's quite a long time yep. to sort of tell, well, ha hang on a minute, say, say someone's, someone drops out of the England team and you've got to find out why and how. I, I did that World Cup final when uh, uh, Ronaldo, the other Ronaldo, the Brazilian Ronaldo, was on the off the team sheet and then on the team sheet again, all within an hour before the kickoff. <laughs> So, and, and the World Cup final in Brazil, where um, Sammy Kadira, I think it was, got, um, got injured in the warm-up. So you had to, and another, pl another player comes in. So you've got to be on your toes, so don't overthink it, but give it the gun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, do, do you feel any nerves when you go into a game of this magnitude? Because particularly nowadays where sound bites travel, yeah. do you ever feel like going into a game, you, you have to be ready to nail a particular moment because you know that's what's going to be repeated more so than maybe ever before? Yes. Um, I, I, I don't think, though, I mean, I can't speak for the younger commentators, obviously, but I, people say to me, oh, what did you, when did you write the Aguero line before it happened? I said, if you thought that I could imagine <laughs> that kind of, you know, um, I, think, I think I've always believed that the one quality, and I'm sure you've got it, Harry, as well, and, and I wish you well with your commentary thank you, ambitions. Thank you is the love of the game. The love of the game will get you through anything because you know what it means. And don't be frightened. If, 
I always feel, I can always say to people, I've got two things people ask me to say, one of which is the, the, the Aguero, which I can't do, because I can't get to that yeah. level. And, and it's live, which I can do. And it's live, you know, I can, I can do that. But um, you've got to be prepared to go to that level and let your, and, and it must, to you, feel that you've gone to that level, I think. Um, and it, you're right, the soundbite thing is, is a bit of a culture, which I think is very unfair on commentators because you pride yourself on the 90 minutes, you know, yeah. or 120 minutes or the penalty shootout or what. Um, so, uh, in a way, I think I, I understand why it's done, and, but I think maybe commentators now go in thinking about sound bites, which I've never done. I've never done that. But that's because that's my time, you know? But I'm still working. And so I will be hopefully back on the, the world feeds when the season starts again. And it'll be difficult. I'll probably be more, you asked about nerves, I'll probably be more nervous sitting as a fan tomorrow than I ever would be as a commentator. Well, you're in work mode, aren't you? So it's, yeah. it's a bit different. <laughs> yeah, and it is. And you, but you are, it is a job to be done. You're part of a big team. Television is a big team. And you don't want to let anybody down. I think that's the, that's the first thing I can remember feeling not very well in a game, um, a Premier League game a couple of years ago and thinking I've got to keep going, you know, there's no sub, I can't be taken off after like, gosh, I played as a forward, you know, I would hate it now, you're taken off after 65 minutes every game, I mean that would, I got taken off when there was one sub mind you, so, but, but by, by and large, um, we, we do the 90 minutes as broadcasters, we do the 120 minutes and we're very privileged to do it. Do you ever look at social media or anything to try and gauge how a particular bit of commentary went down? No, but I am on social media and I'm doing a podcast called The Joy of Football with Brilliant. a very good guy called... Where can people find it? On all the usual things. It's on um, YouTube, it's on Spotify. I do it with Neil Barnett, who used to be the... Um, the, the older Chelsea fans remember him. He's the pitch announcer at Chelsea okay. for a long time. Worked for Chelsea for a long time. But he, the last 15 years, he's been the voice of from England on the American channel Sirius XM, which is, has the, the market leader in the United States. So he's got a massive following in, uh, in the USA. So we're, we've started from, um, we're just doing it generically. We're not, we're not, there's no way we're sponsored or anything like that. We're just giving it a go and having some fun. And believe it or not, my, my itinerary after the game is to get back home as quickly as possible so we can do it. We do it in Neil's kitchen, which I think is, the podcast should be called that, really. But I, I only agree to do it because it, it, it emphasizes the joy of football. Football gives me so much joy. Of course, we'll raise issues, but he's the, he's the ranter, and I go, hang on a minute, Neil, come on. <laughs> anyway, that's so, so, but to answer your question, no, I mean, you know, if, if I, sometimes people stop me and say, oh, uh, the Chelsea fans didn't like that or whatever. And I go, well, you know, what happened? I'll tell you a story about it, about how people, I, I would like to react if somebody says, I did a game where Gareth Southgate was playing for Aston Villa and he made two mistakes and it cost two goals. And I saw him at an England game, he was an England player at the time, a few weeks later and I said, sorry you know about that. He said, well, you're doing your job. You're doing your job. So if people don't like it because it's against their team, I, 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 you know, you're trying to do your job. You, I couldn't pretend that Gareth hadn't made those mistakes, though he was, exactly. you know, then, even then, he was very much in the, uh, in the commentary world as a really good guy, you know, somebody. That, but you can't, you can't duck those things. So social media will probably throw up a few things and go, well, did I do it? If I got it wrong, hands up. But if I was doing my job, the answer isn't it that's all that matters for sure yeah. social media is such a big part of the game nowadays in many ways i feel like it's maybe gone a bit too far in well, terms I, of I don't think that's connected just to football uh, i'm sure many people would agree with you but i think it's gone too far in very other every other aspect that it is i just think i don't mind i i, I if i do something i say it's me and i, I think the anonymity of it that, that i would change and then let, let, let it be as it is I know there are arguments that people can't reveal who they are for, for reasons of security and their own personal safety. I get that, but I think that doesn't apply to football. I hope it doesn't anyway. So 
Uh, that's what I would say. If you're going to do some football criticism, stand up and be counted. You know, if somebody walked up to me here where we're talking now, which could happen, couldn't it? <laughs> and said, I, I didn't like the way. Somebody said to me, the, um, I'll give you an example. On the Aguero game, QPR, I remember, went 2 1 up. Yep. Jamie Mackey. Somebody in Manchester, a Manchester City game said, You shouted too loud when Jamie Mackey scored. And I go, Yeah, they're near the bottom of the league and they're putting them 2 1 up and you know, all the consequences for the two Manchester yep. clubs. And he goes, no, you, it was too loud. He wouldn't have to, he wouldn't, I couldn't debate it with him. So that's what you're up against, really. Um, but uh, Jamie Mackey deserved a bit of that piece. And they played Jekko's goal occasionally, which made it 2-2. They never played Jamie Mackey's goal. It was a really good goal. <laughs> You almost need that thick skin, don't you, to be able to, oh, to yes. know that you're doing your job to the best of your ability and the rest of it is just noise. You have to trust yourself. And of course, it's not your decision. It's the boss's decision in the end. So if they feel, um, I don't know, you'd have to ask those who are bosses how much social media makes them factor in their decisions. But if you get to a high level as a player, as a coach and as a broadcaster, then, you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to take it on the chin, really. And... Uh, unless it's absolutely, I, I'll always talk to people about it if they if they're, um, want a conversation rather than an argument, you know, and they're trying to explain what I thought at the time. But it's instinctive, so much, you know, you do it. Sometimes you just do it, and people come back to you and say, Did you really want to say that? And I go, Well, that's what I felt at the time, you know. Yeah, but they went on and lost the game. Well, they shouldn't have done that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just a couple of quick questions yeah. to wrap up. Um, who's been your England player of the tournament so far? I know we haven't had the final yet, so it's difficult to give a definitive answer. Mm. But if it were to be decided right now, who would be your standout performer? Mark Gay, who I have met a couple of times, is uh, another one. Who's, it's a great cred credit to Gareth. He's, and the football industry generally. There's so much more education. People are more confident. They do interviews for the website and for their clubs and so they're much more uh, able to I, I've only met Mark I've never interviewed him I've only met him socially he's a charming young man and you know he, he left Chelsea at a time where many people might have stayed and say well I'll sweat it out he thought I'm good enough to go again and uh, he's found himself at Palace and what about Palace I mean they've had scorers in the Copa America they've got four players in the squad here and you know they've, they've, they're, they're really going places Joachim Anderson was very unlucky but had a very good tournament yep. for, uh, for Denmark so yeah I, I think it's obviously relative to what was expected and pretty much all of them had their moments um, but I think I, I think everyone's very proud of how um, Mark has taken that opportunity of all the bad luck for Harry Maguire and, and when he's not playing of course then Esri Konsa comes in and plays just as well so um, you know that, that's also a good sign yeah. in the camp so it felt like that was going to be potentially a problem area for England yeah. and it hasn't been which is a testament we should praise Aston come. Villa Oli goes and wins the game and Villa are in the Champions League and, and, and Esri Konsa has played his part in this tournament um, my partner's a teacher and she teaches a uh, Ten-year-old tutors. He's a Villa fan, so uh, every time she goes to, to to have a session with him, I go, just say, just check that he saw us we got to play, or, or what about Ollie Watkins? You know. So, um, in, yeah, it, I think that's a nice thing about you know Palace Villa. It's a spread of clubs. One thing I think has been shown, and maybe this is one thing that um, the, the, the critics are not really engaged in, is. Look at the football that is played in the Premier League. Pass, keeping possession. It's a possession-based game at yep. the moment, a passing-based game. So if England plays slowly, that's the way they're playing for their clubs, you know? And I mean, obviously, Gareth could say, well, hang on, I don't want you to do that. But one of the things about coaching is you really should um, use the players to the strength that they have in their club football, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't get the time on the training ground that no, you get at no. club level, so you need to no. just... I, was, I, I coach a bit in non-league and I always say to forwards, when I've got a new forward, I say, As a, we've got a corner, where do you want to go? Where's, where's your best place? Do you want to go near post or far post? I can't say we'd accommodate it, but I'd like to know. Yeah. And, and, and on the bigger picture, the better, much better level, I think uh, England are doing that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and we've got to win. <laughs> we haven't got to win, but I'd really love us to win because... You know, I've been around a long time and, and uh, we won the under 18 Euros with Gary Neville playing when I was commentating. We won the Tournoi 
Yeah, I remember the 98 that, yeah. World Cup that I was commentating on that. But I'm not commentating tomorrow. I'd love to be, but I'm not. And I would, I'm happy to be here. I'm very lucky to be here. Let's get your final prediction then, Martin. How's it going to go? England versus Spain, Euro 2024 final here in Berlin. But I think it could easily go the distance. I think England have to deal with the quality of Spain. I, I look at who can win, win a match for you. They've got players who can win matches. The wingers, obviously. Danny Olmo, terrific player. Rodri, still KP, he's won big games, hasn't he? And then I look and think, well, hang on a minute, we've got plenty of players who can win matches. So it will be coming down to those moments. I'd be surprised if it's nil-nil going to extra time. Uh, so I think it'll be, it'll be easier on, on the English hearts if England win 2-0 after 90 minutes, I'd take that. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Martin, thank you very much for joining pleasure. us. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks, Harry.